please welcome Steve Osterle. Thank you, bro. Um, I was just mentioning, Patrick, to some people upstairs that I go to a lot of conferences. I rarely go to something as well organized as this, and I want to congratulate you and all your colleagues uh, who put this together. I like to think that Medtronic is the world's leader in neuroengineering by far, and certainly in the commercialized sense of it, but I don't go anywhere in the world like I do when I come here to EPFL and see the quality of the neuroengineering that goes on at EPFL and at the Wyss Institute, and we covet, actually, the applied science and all the things are done here. It's, it's most unique, I think the most unique place in the world, so I'm particularly happy to have a few moments to share some thoughts with you about how we view neuroengineering and, and this translation from the, much of the science, lots of it occurring right here in Switzerland, to a chance to actually commercialize things. I think everyone has understood that there's a move afoot here at the brain forum, at, at the brain, human brain project uh, around the world to try to understand how is it that the brain works and fundamentally get at what's wrong when things aren't working in the brain. And the goal, of course, ultimately is to preserve brain function and when it's gone astray to figure out ways to deliver therapy to the brain. I'm a cardiologist, but I spend a lot of time in the neurospace and what's, what's one of the many, many unique things about the brain uh, beyond our sort of paucity of understanding, is that it's actually very hard to treat brain disease. Uh, God, for lots of, I think, very good reasons, has constructed what's known as the blood-brain barrier. It's very hard to get things into the brain, even simple drugs. You heard from Dr. Benabee this morning that some drugs like L-DOPA get into the brain, but it gets everywhere in the brain, and not only that, it goes everywhere else in the body. And when you think about it, taking drugs orally to try to get them into the brain in some quantity makes little sense to me. Uh, I think you can make a very cogent argument that drugs that you want to get to the brain should be directly delivered to the brain, if at all possible, not only to get around the blood-brain barrier, but also to mitigate or lessen the side effects of taking drugs that are systemically distributed with the hope that you get some useful amount of drug to the area of action. Now, this actually gets even much harder when you start contemplating giving biologics to the brain, and whether you're talking about monoclonal antibodies, therapeutic proteins, uh, protein interference, um, microRNA, as you name it, none of these things get into the brain by ingestion or injection. So the, you must necessarily begin to think about how do we get targeted, controlled, local delivery to the brain for all these interesting biologics that are being developed that I think have real promise for not only therapy, but for restoration and cure for some of these diseases. So I'm going to just highlight for you some of the work that we've been working on at Medtronic to try to figure out a way to get local drug delivery to various aspects of the brain. And I'm going to end with just a few comments about thinking about using electrons as drugs. I think that's, it goes against kind of conventional knowledge, particularly here in the Swiss Republic, where you have so many great pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I don't know that they actually think of electrons as drugs. Some do, uh, and you, you've seen a move towards what's known as electroceuticals or bioelectronic medicine. I'll say just a few words about that at the end. So we make really the only commercially available and plantable pump system. This becomes, I think, an important story as you think about targeted, controlled local delivery. Most of these drugs need continuous therapy, particularly biologics. Uh, they all have short half-lives. So that if you want to contemplate a scheme where you'd be giving things to the central nervous system, uh, particularly biologics, I think you have to have in the back of your mind that there's going to have to be some kind of infusion system that goes along with this, that just simple one-time treatments are not likely to work with the possible exception of local gene delivery, uh, where you might get away with one or two injections, but most of the interesting things that we see in development in the biological pipeline are around therapeutic proteins, antibodies, and protein interference, all of which I think are going to require an infusion system. So I'm going to show you actually three routines that we're working on to try to deliver drugs uh, to the central nervous system. The first is highly commercialized. This is a implantable pump. Again, it's refillable. It has a 60 millimeter, millimeter reservoir, 60 cc's. Uh, we place a catheter into the interthecal space and we deliver drug that bays the spinal cord. Uh, this has uh, been used in about a quarter of a million people and you can sort of see the two main indications for this. So this is highly commercialized. It's been around for, for 15 years probably. 
And we use this for chronic pain syndromes. It's a really interesting way to give morphine without having central effects. This doesn't get up into the central nervous system. It stays in the spinal column and bays the spinal cord. We also deliver drugs like baclofen, uh, Leorosol, which is a drug that locally treats the spinal cord for spasticity. So this is an example of how you can sort of defeat the blood-brain barrier and also get away from a lot of the side effects of these highly toxic uh, medicines or narcotics. Illustrated in this little cartoon are, are sort of three ways that we have strategies for getting drug to the central nervous system. I've already showed you in, in the first scheme on the left, this is intrathecal drug delivery. It can actually, if you give it in the right doses, uh, get into the cisterns of the brain and you can begin to bathe the ventricles of the brain through just coming up the back door through an intrathecal delivery. Uh, it's actually quite easy, and you heard, uh, you saw Dr. Benneby talk about putting leads into the ventricles. It's, it's actually quite easy to target the ventricles, uh, and then you come through the frontal lobe, and you don't do a lot of damage on the way, and you can actually deliver drugs. I'm going to show you an, an interesting example of why you might want to do that and where you would do that, and that's pretty straightforward. The biggest challenge is interparenchymal delivery of drug, and again, not, not, it's obviously the, the biggest opportunity as well. And I'm going to show you some preclinical work that we've done with both intracerebral and also interparenchymal delivery of biologic agents in an attempt to mitigate disease. So here's an example of what we envision might be an interesting opportunity to use targeted controlled local drug delivery to deliver monoclonal antibodies. There's probably been 30 or so attempts to give intravenous monoclonal antibodies against beta amyloid with the hope that somehow you could leach out the plaques of Alzheimer's disease. Let's set aside for a moment whether that's even the proximate cause of Alzheimer's disease. Let's just accept that there's a target there and it's, it's an abnormal tangle of proteins. Uh, and so people have been giving intravenous monoclonal antibodies with the hope that some of this might get to the brain. And, and what it does is it leaches beta amyloid out of the brain through the blood vessels on the surface of the brain, it causes a, a cerebritis and an inflammation of the brain, and it doesn't effectively get amyloid out. So no one's ever actually succeeded at this. And we thought, well, why don't we, instead of trying to get antibodies near the brain through the blood circulation, actually deliver them deliberately into the ventricles? And so this is an example of, of this in action. This is a preclinical study that we did with an aged monkey. Uh, study where we infused our own monoclonal antibody that we developed against beta amyloid. Uh, and again, this is just a proof of concept. This is not a clinical study with humans, but again, I, I show this to you simply to stimulate your imagination. And so there's a lot of things that you could do. That, again, this route is very straightforward. It's a simple thing to do. We put the pump in the abdomen, it's refillable. Uh, the pump has a seven to eight year life in continuous operation. And so that we can then just deliver a catheter, uh, tunnel it up through the neck, it sounds barbaric, it's pretty straightforward, and actually just tunnel this through the skull into the ventricle and it's, it stays there, it's a flap of skin over so it doesn't get infected. So again, those of you who are thinking about delivering agents to the brain, if you think that maybe just by bathing the cerebral spinal fluid you get away with, this is a really straightforward way to do it. I mentioned the harder thing, of course, is to deliver drug to the tissue of the brain itself the challenge here, which is probably obvious to everyone in the back of the room, is that you don't want to blow the brain up by infusing things into it. And so the, the question that you all should be having is how can you deliver agents continuously into the parenchyma of the brain without damaging tissue and causing necrosis? And again, so we've developed special catheter systems that have convection type technology that uh, delivers the right amount of drug at the right time, at the right speed, without actually causing brain damage. So you might say, why would you want to do that? Well, um, there's a lot of diseases in the parenchyma. You heard about them today, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease. I'll show an example of that in a minute, that are parenchymal diseases, and you're not going to get at them through the cerebral spinal fluid. This is the system we use. It's, it, we've developed these catheter systems. They're far from perfect. Uh, we're still working on them. Uh, but I'll show you an example of a preclinical study that, where this has been used actually to knock down the Huntington gene. But it, essentially, the pump is hooked up to a splitter, and we can put little cannula into targets of the brain. And again, it's, it's simply like the deep brain stimulation you saw earlier today. You just have to pick the right target uh, and decide where you want to deliver this. In the case of Huntington's disease, you, those of you who were here yesterday, I thought it was actually probably the best talk of the seminar, a phenomenal talk uh, about Huntington's disease. It's, it's, it, the disease is largely in the putamen, and this, you saw examples yesterday of how the brain basically is destroyed by this 
abnormal production of the Huntington protein. So you heard yesterday, and again, it's an extraordinary story, that Huntington's disease is caused by a single, a single mutant allele making one abnormal protein. So surely if we could knock down that gene and somehow silence the protein production, that would be good. And it could be restorative and potentially curative for Huntington's. That was our hypothesis. Uh, most of you probably know in 2006, the Nobel Prize was given for the discovery of how proteins are silenced naturally in the body through interfering RNA. And we hooked up with a company called Onylum Pharmaceuticals in Cambridge, Massachusetts, to set out to basically test the hypothesis, could we knock down the Huntington gene? Everyone knew that there was no way to get sRNA into the brain except by some kind of infusion system. I and mean, there's delivery challenges at all levels. I mean, those of you who are biologists in the room know that not only do you have to get it to the area of interest, but you have to get the sRNA into the cell. So there's two levels of delivery challenges here. I'm just talking about the macro delivery challenge. Uh, well, this is actually naked sRNA that we delivered to primates, non-human. And this is just a demonstration of principle. Again, uh, we're so far away from having this be a commercialized product. But I wanted to show you this to you because this is an example of how you translate our knowledge of disease, mutant allele, uh, destroying brain tissue, how you translate that into something that actually could be good for humankind and could be a commercial product. And there are other things, I mean, you can think about this. Let's take Parkinson's, for example. Uh, we have been working with a pharmaceutical company to deliver a glial-derived neurotrophic factor directly into the parenchyma of the brain to try to resuscitate failing neurons that should be making dopamine by basically giving them a growth factor. Again, use your imagination. There's a lot of things that you can do like this, and this is just an example. And, and again, this always surprises some people that we're doing this, uh, but this is the only way, I'm certain of this, this is the only way you're going to get biologics into the brain. So whether you're talking about genes, therapeutic proteins, protein interference, cells, uh, you're going to have to infuse them and locally deliver them. And so it's going to take navigation, which we have. We had it for deep brain stimulation. We had to have it. It's going to take navigation technology, infusion technology, catheter technology, and of course, formulation technology. And so it'll be a joint effort amongst a lot of people in this room. This example was for Huntington's disease. Uh, this is an autoradiograph showing that we delivered sRNA, the, the green and red is various concentrations of sRNA that lit up. It's, it's an autoradiography. On the right side of the screen, you'll see that on the left-hand panel is immunostaining for the Huntington protein, and it's a gradient. So C is right in the middle of this, and A is at the periphery. And you can see that we actually effectively knocked down the Huntington protein. For those who think, yeah, you did this by destroying everything there, you just blew up the area, it's, it's a nuclear wasteland. Uh, the slide to the right is actually a initial stain that just shows that the neurons are still alive in the area that we knocked down the Huntington protein. This is wild Huntington protein. This is not a model of Huntington's disease. No one really knows what Huntington protein does, but I'm certain that it can be knocked down. It's, it's probably one of the best targets ever for interference RNA and just an example of interparenchymal drug delivery. I wanted to stop uh, just to say a few words about using electrons as drugs. Again, about two years ago, GlaxoSmithKline formed a venture group. They called it Action Potential Ventures, and they started investing in what they termed was electroceuticals or bioelectronic medicine. Those of us that try and kind of look blankly at each other and said, what are they talking about? This is neuromodulation. We've been doing it for 30 years, and Professor Benabid gave you the best example earlier today of how you can use electrons as drugs. Those examples you saw of dystonia and Parkinson's disease, those weren't his best examples. That's a routine result from deep brain stimulation. And if you think about it, everything in the body, whether it's the blinking of your eye, the waving of your hand, the beating of your heart, the contraction of your gut, the release of digestive enzymes, the release of neurotransmitters, anything that you can think of, that's a physiologic function can be reduced without question to an electrical chemical reaction. So it shouldn't surprise anyone in this room that if I took two electrodes and put them into you, Bruno, anywhere and turned them on, something would happen. Now, not always good, but we aim to make it good and we know that we can modulate virtually any system in the body through electrical stimulation. Uh, because it gets at this sort of ion channel ultimately and, and the chemical reactions that result from changing in ion channels. 
So uh, you heard about deep brain stimulation. I'm not going to say a lot about this. Um, you saw this. I mean, most of the deep brain stimulation that we do, whether it's for movement disorders, chronic pain syndromes, psychiatric disorders, eating disorders, all of these things basically occur in the deep brain through a series of structures known as the basal ganglia. Again, I'm a cardiologist. I mean, we have mainly people in neural here. You know this better than I do, but I like to think of the basal ganglia as the Cisco systems of your mind. Everything gets routed through here, movement, thought. So again, it shouldn't be surprised if you went down and did lesions here or if you did high frequency stimulation that something would happen hopefully good. And so this, this, there's no end of opportunity to do deep brain stimulation. You heard from Professor Benabid, in his case, he said this is a tedious procedure. It's a tedious procedure for everyone. So the challenges are how do we make this easier and simpler to do so that it can be widespread, more affordable, all the things that came up. But th th this is a, a phenomenal, phenomenal opportunity to treat the brain for all sorts of things. The downside of this, of course, is that it's not curative. This is all just treating palliative symptoms. Uh, you, it turns out, and I, and I mentioned, and I'll stop with this slide, is that uh, there's no end of opportunity to do what we have thought of as neuromodulation. The rest of the world is now calling electroceuticals or bioelectronic medicine. I've listed here just 10 companies out of maybe 20 or 30 that I could have put on this slide if they'd fit. Uh, Medtronic has invested in six or seven of these. Um, these are all examples, and you can read to the far right, you can see what are they trying to treat Again, none of this is curative. It's all palliative, which is why the first part of this slide, this story is more interesting to me, which is targeted drug delivery. If you bring biologics, they should mimic human biology and they should be restorative and curative. All these things are palliative, meaning they're lessening the symptoms of disease, but they're powerful. I just might bring your attention to the last one. I mean, who in the room would think that you could treat inflammatory bowel disease and rheumatoid arthritis by stimulating the vagal nerve? Well, it turns out that the, you heard earlier today that the vagus nerve is a wandering nerve. It goes everywhere, not only the gut, but it goes to the spleen, it goes to your eyes, it goes to all your blood vessels, it goes to a lot of places. And so you want to selectively stimulate that. And when you do, you can actually inhibit vagal fibers going to the spleen. They're involved in recruiting immune cells that are involved in inflammatory responses. So read about this company. It's one of the most interesting companies that I've seen in the last decade. It's called Setpoint Medical. That is, is not our company. It's a private startup. Pretty interesting thing. Uh, Novacure is another interesting company. I mean, we could go on and on. These guys are passing electromagnetic waves through, pulsating waves through the brain externally to try to break up mitotic cells. It turns out all the spindles that go together for, to separate chromosome, th these, these mitotic spindles are dipolar. And so if you actually pass electromagnetic fields through it, you can actually disrupt this. And they have some really interesting clinical data. Again, this example of electronic medicine. Uh, we're actually involved in a trial in Toronto with Dr. Lozano to do, it's called functional neuromodulation. It's the second one on this slide, which is there is some preliminary evidence that you can actually rejuvenate dormant circuits in the brain by stimulating them. And this may be a treatment for Alzheimer's disease. But go down the list. I mean, there's something electrical for whatever ails you. And again, I thought I would just bring this up and leave it here today is that not everything is pharmaceutical in the treatment of central and peripheral nervous system. And a lot of this can be done with electrons. And if you want to have effective therapies with pharmaceuticals and biologics, you're going to have to have controlled drug delivery. Thank you very much.